Good evening, everybody. Kyle with Andrew Hilton, and welcome back. This is our ninth virtual wine tasting, and our topic tonight is Portugal. Now, Portugal isn't a particularly big country. Compared to Spain, it's barely a rounding error, and I've horribly now offended every single Portuguese person in attendance. Um, but Portugal is really, really interesting. Um, compared to France, where you'll see international varieties all over the place, especially in the south of France, where you'll see Cabernet growing next to Chardonnay, growing next to Syrah, which doesn't make a lot of sense unless you're trying to, you know, make a $12 bottle of wine and sell on the international market. Now that style of winemaking we see really heavily in Italy and France and Spain and the New World, and it's starting to creep even into Germany a little tiny bit. I do occasionally see something like a German Merlot, which is a thing that should not be. Um, if you remember back to, I think, our third wine tasting, uh, even Franz Weniger, he had the Vom Kalk, which was predominantly um, Merlot and uh, Syrah, I believe. But Portugal, for whatever reason, there's a good reason for it, we'll get to that, they've managed to remain relatively independent from that. There was a little bit of international planting uh, done around the city of Lisbon proper. Uh, I did bring a map, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but they've really worked with their own varieties. and. That's really interesting because whereas, you know, when we do these tastings, very often we're left talking about, well, this is the Malbec and this is the Cab and this is the Syrah. Um, here we're going to be talking about grape varieties that really um, we don't really talk about anywhere else in the world. Um, there's a grape variety here uh, called Ergonias in one part of the country and uh, Tintoreris in another part of the country. It's actually a very familiar Spanish variety, and we'll get to that. But uh, most of the Portuguese varieties are unique to Portugal, and that's why I really, really like them. Uh, now we're going to jump over to the map here just for a moment, uh, and we are going to focus in the north. Now we can kind of split Portugal into effectively three sections. You've got North Portugal, and this is most of your premium wine country. You've got the Vino Verde region up here. You've got the Douro Valley, which we will taste the Douro Red here shortly, and it's also the Port Lodges. Uh, you've got Dao and Bairada. In the center, you've got Tejo and Lisboa and uh, the Alentejo or Alentejano regions. Um, the stuff down here on the coast, Tejo and Lisboa, this is really bulk winemaking production. When you do see those kind of international varieties grown in Portugal, you're seeing them right down here next to Lisboa. Uh, and then Setubal is really, really famous for one of the oldest dessert wines in the world, uh, Moscatel de Setubal, uh, which I don't have in the store at the minute. Um, and then finally, way down here on the Gulf of Cadiz, just outside the, uh, the exit to the Mediterranean, uh, here there'll be dragons. Um, I've never even had a chance to try wine from this region of Portugal. Uh, I've done some reading. It's a lot of uh, big chunky reds. It's a lot of rosé. And it's actually a surprising amount of fortified wines. But I can't really speak to these because I've never had the opportunity to try them. And then off the coast uh, of North Africa, we have, we have the island of Madeira, which we're not going to talk about too much tonight. So let's start in the north. Let's start with the region of Minho and the wine region of Vinho Verde. Now, Vinho Verde literally means green wine. Now, you know, I don't care how good your imagination is, this wine isn't actually green. Um, a lot of the wineries, uh, particularly Gejela uh, and Cachal Garcia, they actually do play off that and they put a slightly yellow wine in a blue glass bottle to create a green cast to the wine in the bottle. Um, the wines are never actually green. When we're talking green, we're talking the wines are picked either slightly underripe or just at the point of ripeness. We're going for wines that have, you know, a low alcohol, they have some really pretty freshness, and they have a little bit of sparkle to them as well. Um, now, when we talk about wines that have a little bit of sparkle to them, if we go back to the German tasting where we tasted the lights and we tasted the Seabrick wines that had a little bit of petience to them, in that case, the petience was very often due to the wine getting a little bit of a top up of SO2 right at bottling. Um, with Vino Verde, that's not usually the case. Uh, they actually usually bottle it as it's undergoing malolactic conversion, uh, which is basically the malic acid, which is the acid that uh, oxidizes very, very quickly in apples and pears and leads them to turn brown into lactic acid, which is that uh, wine, wine acid that we associate usually with milk, but more often than not we associate that with kind of big buttery Chardonnays or with virtually every red wine on earth. They have all undergone that conversion. Um, if you bottle right as that's undergoing, it does produce a little bit of uh, CO2 as part of its process, and we actually capture that to get a little bit of pétillance in the wine. So in this case it's a bit of natural pétillance, done in a really unusual way that I don't think there's anywhere else in the world other than Vino Verde that really does it that way. Um, these days we think of Vino Verde as a white. 
Uh, and I've never seen a red one. Uh, contrast that with 100 years ago, where virtually all Vino Verde was red. Um, it's one of those little f fun facts that you read in wine textbooks. It's like, yes, Vino Verde is exclusively white. And 100 years ago, it was exclusively red. And then they just drop it. Uh, I did quite a bit of digging into this to try and find out why that was. Um, there are apparently still some red Vino Verdes made in Portugal. But again, I've never seen them. Now, that's one thing I want to get to right away. We've talked about how many times have I said tonight, I've never seen them. Well, really, for most any wine from Spain, I've seen it, or I can get it, or it's around. Um, a lot of the wines from Austria and Hungary, which are kind of the new sexy things on the international wine scene, we can get those. We can get Chopron. We can get uh, everything from the Burgenland. We can get all. We can get Tokai. We can get all kinds of things. But Portugal, there's a lot of things that we're not seeing yet. So Portugal's got a little bit of an undiscovered country characteristic to it. Uh, this is a premium Vino Verde. Uh, it is a single grape variety called Lurero. Most Vino Verdes are a blend of Lurero and Alvarino. Um, and if you go north of Portugal into uh, the Galician region of Spain, which is a little bit of Spain that sticks out to the north of Portugal uh, there on the Atlantic Ocean, um, it's the same thing there. Lots of Alvarino, lots of Lurero. Very, very kind of, for this part of the world, for the Iberian Peninsula, cold climate, high acid white wine making. Oh, Darren and Melissa joined. That's wonderful. Uh, oh, hello, Hand. Getting into it early tonight. I like it. Now, this, as I was saying, is a premium Vino Verde in the sense that this is about a twenty to twenty-one dollar Vino Verde. Most Vino Verdes that we, even we have in the store are around kind of ten, eleven, twelve dollars. Um, the big two that you see all the time are Casa Garcia and Gazela. Um, Portuguese wine in the premium category. Um, is a bit of a new animal. We haven't seen it historically. Um, Portugal, for a large part of its production, uh, the last statistic I was able to get for it was uh, dating back to 2011, which of course is almost 10 years old now. Uh, but 43% of the wines in Portugal weren't made uh, on little tiny estates. They weren't, you know, one-off estate wines. Um, they were made by big cooperatives. So if you want to think of those as being kind of Jackson Trigg style uh, wine cooperatives where everybody just pitches and grapes into a big pool and then somebody makes the wines independent of the individual wine grower with no real you know, sense of place or sense of soils or anything else. Cooperative wines can be quite good. I've had decent cooperative wines, but fully 43% of their wines are still made that way, which is a bit of a shame. Um, when we talk about Portuguese wine being a little backwards, it's kind of funny that one of the very first like international major mega hits for wine uh, was actually Portuguese, which was Matus Rosé in about uh, the mid-1970s. Um, now, some of you obviously will remember Matus Rosé kind of being a precursor to White Zinfandel, um, but it was one of those things that we still carried when I started here in 2000. We had Matus Rosé on the shelf because kind of like Apothic Red, it sells well enough you can't stop carrying it. Uh, and it was really what most people associated with Portuguese wine was this inexpensive sweet rosé made by the biggest cooperative group in Portugal, which is called Sogrip. Um, and they still make wine to this day. Uh, we actually carry uh, one of their wines, the Gazela Vino Verde is actually a uh, Sogrip product. But let's talk about this one a little bit. Uh, alcohol is a little higher than a lot of Vino Verdes. A lot of them will hover around 9 to 11%. This is at 12. Uh, your premium Vino Verdes do tend to be a little bit higher in alcohol because they actually will let the grapes sit on the vine a little closer to physical mat or um, physiological maturity, uh, which allows that richer, more evolved character where it's not just bright, fresh lime and grass and a little bit of fizz and Bob's your uncle. Um, to my palate, I, I personally prefer white sangria to red, and those kind of $11 white sang uh, white Vino Verdes, they're actually the perfect thing to make sangria with. Uh, let's have a look and see what we got for comments. And yes, I, uh, I also agree that the map is a good touch. Um, I'm, I need to bring my World Atlas of Wine into the store to do these because I really need better maps. Um, this is from uh, what I consider the most indispensable wine manual on earth, which is uh, Jensen Robinson's uh, Oxford Companion to Wine. Uh, with this, the World Atlas of Wine uh, and Oz Clark's uh, Grapes and Wines, uh, I think, are uh, really the, the three most uh, important wine books going. Uh, but yeah, I really like having a map because I find that 
really, really helpful me, for me as well as a teaching tool. Uh, quickly see what else we got. And yeah, Don, I, I, I really love this wine. This is so fresh and it's bright and it's summery and it's, it's exactly what you'd want on kind of a warm evening like this. And we've had a weird week. You know, on Wednesday I was thinking, oh, it's going to be so nice and warm and summery. Let's do wheat beers that are just the most summery thing. And it absolutely pounded rain on us. Now it's like, okay, well, we're going to do one summery thing, but it's early spring and it's been kind of chilly. Let's do a little heavier reds. And now it's warm and nice outside, so I can't predict the weather worth a darn. And Jeremy, I'm glad. Uh, how did your uh, how did your Riesling that you ended up cooking uh, the uh, scallops with? How did that turn out? Because I uh, I'm kind of invested in my recommendation for your cooking one on that. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a premium version of a traditionally inexpensive wine. It's light. It's fresh. It's undergone malolactic fermentation, but it hasn't undergone it in the sense that it sits in an oak barrel, which is how most do. We end up with a light, fresh, beautiful wine, lots of beautiful, just fun, fresh, fruity characteristics. This isn't the most serious wine in the world. Um, it's just light fun. It's not supposed to be serious, and it's, it's done very, very well. Um, this is really typical of uh, Vino Verde. We do have a more serious version of this wine, same winery, um, but using the other major grape variety of the region. So instead of being made with Luero, it's being made with Alvarino. Uh, and they're doing this in orange wine. So they're introducing skin contact on the white grapes. Uh, it's called the Alvarino Contacto, and I think it's $2 more than the Moro Santigos. Um, it's a real love it or hate it for people. I have some people who just come in and get it every week, and I have some people who are like, what in the name of hell did you sell me? So that one's a bit of a love it or hate it, but I really like it. OK, now let's jump on. So we'll go back to our map here really quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about Port and the Douro Valley here shortly. but. We're going to talk about this big, super non-continuous region called the Alentejo or the Alentejano. Two names for the same thing. Um, this is the predominant high-quality Portuguese wine region of kind of the central to southern part of the country. Most of your real premium regions, the Douro, the Dao, Barrada, Vino Verde, they're all in the north. Southern Portugal is hotter. It's drier. Uh, it is historically poorer. Um, most of the money that comes into southern Portugal is not agricultural. A lot of it's actually tourism driven, uh, especially right along kind of that uh, Gulf of Cadiz coast. Um, when you hear of uh, Brits going to Portugal on holiday, they're very, going they're very often going down to that part of Portugal to sit on the beach. Um, but I really like these styles of wines. The Douro wines are very intense, very inky, very powerful, very serious which makes sense. They're just dry ports, and ports are so concentrated they can live for centuries. But the ones in the Alentejo, they use their own grape varieties. They're a little bit more wild. They're a little more rustic. They're a little earthier. In style, they remind me a great deal of Spain's region of Castilla y Leon in the sense of they use a whole bunch of grape varieties that I don't usually see. Uh, I actually had to look up grape varieties for this one, um, and very often they have their own like unique names for grape varieties. Uh, these first two edge up on being close to natural wines. Carlos Reynolds, in particular, talks about their use of no pesticides and herbicides in the winery or uh, in the vineyard, no, uh, no cultured yeast, uh, and absolutely uh, the bare minimum of sulfur added to it. Great varieties on this cat are Alicante Bouchette, uh, Aragones, we'll return to that, uh, Alfroquiero, and uh, Trincadera. Had to look up a couple of these. Uh, Alicante Bouchette, I know quite well. Um, you'll also see it uh, listed as Garacha Tintorera. Uh, so this is what we call a Tinturier grape variety. So most grape varieties, if you cut into them and you turn them open, even if it has a dark black purple skin, inside it has green juice. There's a subgroup of grape varieties called Tinturiers. Um, these are grapes that if you cut into them, they actually have red or pinkish juice. So you can actually make a red white wine from them by you know, allowing it no skin contact, but if you make a wine from it, it is actually naturally quite a deep ruby red without ever seeing skin contact. For a very long time, we actually had an Australian Alicante Bouchette, which was dark red. It looked for all the world like a red wine, but it was actually, strictly speaking, from a winemaking perspective, entirely a white wine. 
Uh, the Aragones, uh, that is another word for Tempranillo. The Portuguese have two words for the major Spanish grape. Uh, most planted grape in Spain, and now actually the most planted grape in Portugal as well, uh, overtaking Turiga Nacional. Uh, Tempranillo, of course, is the famous grape that you see in Rioja, in Ribera del Duero, in Navarra, uh, and throughout all of Spain. It's probably their national grape. It is also throughout the Portuguese wine and making industry. It is probably the most international variety that they really plant. But I mean, it's really from the nation next door, still in the Iberian Peninsula. It's as much Portuguese as it is Spanish. Uh, the last two are the re weird ones. Uh, Alfa Quiero, not a great variety I know a very great deal about. Everything you read about it is basically, it's thrown into the grape variety, it's thrown into the wine to add color, and it's in decline all over Portugal. It's not being planted much anymore. Uh, the other one's more interesting, uh, Trincadera. Uh, this has a really, really tea-like aroma. It's very, very pretty and herbal. Uh, and when it's put it into the port blend, it is one of the grapes that goes into the port blend. We'll talk about port when we get to the Duro. Um, it has this unique characteristic that just, you know, Turgan Asinal has all this alcohol and all these really pretty, like, Easter lilies and these really wonderful, like, blackberries and blueberries. Um, Trincadera adds kind of this neat, rustic character. Uh, just checking on questions real quick. Ooh. Uh, lots of oil, olive oil, and lots of wine, and some spices and scallops. Yeah, that seems really good. Boston cheddar sounds perfect. I'm glad you like my pronunciation. I'm quite proud of it. Uh, hello, Steve. Uh, am I sucking out to the geography profs in the audience? Yes, I'm a shameless panderer. Um, I will pander to literally anyone. But beyond that, um, I really find the geography of wine interesting. How, you know, the, the Rheingau, for example, if we jump back to our German tasting from a couple of weeks ago, how this North German region that should be, by all accounts, cold and producing just high acid, steely wines with not a lot of character. Because it's planted on this steep slope, so the vines don't get shaded by the vines in front of them, so it has the river at its foot acting as a mirror and as a heat trap. It has these incredibly like high drainage soils, so the vines get enough water, but not enough that they actually start producing big water fat grapes. The fact that the whole vineyard is basically a giant stone amphitheater that faces due south, so it gets as much light as possible. And out of this steely, icy region, you get these incredible tropical fruit bombs because just this little heat trap, it's absolutely warmer than everywhere around it, and the wines are so different than everything around them. Geography is so important, and geology, of course, to making wine, and it's just so fascinating to me. Um, this is a funny one. Um, Devin and I tasted this wine, I want to say in November-ish, uh, and then with the Russia Christmas and everything else, we got the case in, and we just somehow forgot to put it on the shelf for like two and a half months it just sat in the back and when we kind of started cleaning up the shop after like the madness of Christmas we stumbled across the box and we we're like oh yeah this was really good we've had this for like months why haven't we put this on the shelf uh, and we finally got around to it and it is it's had like almost no uh, press it's had no promotion we maybe put it on like a Friday night wine tasting one time and it's just slowly grown, grown, and grown. You know, every couple of weeks, I don't remember selling a bottle to anybody, but we're out again. Um, this is one that's really been growing for us. And, you know, the Duro vines are very, very important. But this style, this, this field blend from southern Portugal, it just feels so right to me. This is the style of wines from Portugal that I really like to drink. And this is one of those wines that we're just starting to get to. Uh, high alcohol at 14. Uh, I'm starting to feel it here and behind my ears a little bit, which is usually where I feel the warmth from the alcohol. But this is just my style of wine. Um, this is very much what I like to drink for this country. Which is funny, because um, we'll get to this when we, again when we get to the Duro. Man, I've promised a lot for this wine. We are going to be talking about this for the better part of an hour, apparently. Uh, but I actually have a fun story about that, too, uh, related to when I first started at the store. Hmm. Excellent question. Does the price increase with the uh, DOC designation? Um, yes and no. Depends on the DOC. Uh, if something is DOC Lisboa, I would actually be like, 
I'm not sure I agree. Lisboa is usually not very good. Um, I feel like Portugal almost needs something like what we had uh, when we did Spanish tasting, where Spain has, okay, this isn't a very prestigious region, but this is a great winery in this region, and they have the Pago system. So they have a way of recognizing, okay, this isn't the world's greatest wine region, but it can make great wines, and they designate them as Pagos. Portugal doesn't have that system, so you're very much left to saying, okay, well, this is from Alentejano. It makes its DOC grade. Hopefully that means it's going to be good, and after that you're kind of thrown into the situation of, okay, well, it costs this, it should be good at this price. Um, Portugal actually has, um, along with Hungary actually, uh, some of the oldest wine laws uh, in the world. They actually predate the Italians and the French for having wine laws. Um, but because they're very, very old, they perhaps need a bit of an update and uh, could do with a little bit more clarity. That's not to say they're static. It's not like they haven't changed for hundreds of years. Um, with the emergence of new wine regions, they, they do change all the time, but they could do with a little bit of updating. There is some difficulty in navigating the world of Portuguese wine quality. Just And the other reason being, this is all new to us. Like Some of these grape varieties I had to look up. Some of these are grape varieties that most of you are being introduced to the to for the first time. I think most of you have had Tempranillo, but Livrero, Afroquiero, Alicante Bouchette, uh, Trincadera, Turiga Nacional, fr and Franca. Like, these are not great varieties that most people have right off the top of their tongue. Uh, Scotty asks, can we rewatch these tastings if you need a refresher? Yes, all of these are saved uh, universally to Facebook, and I think at least the ones that we've done to YouTube and maybe actually backloaded back to YouTube as well are now on our YouTube channel as well, so they are all rewatchable and will be safe for, st for posterity so you can all make fun of me for stumbling over words and you know swearing on camera and all kinds of things later. Uh, we are slowly compiling out. Hello, Hand. Back to the white again. All right. Apparently that someone's a fan of this. I mean, I am too, but good to see the Hand has excellent taste. Uh, but yes, uh, we do have all of them posted. Uh, great question. Why do grape varieties fail to get planted? Economics. Um, yes, yes, and sometimes no. Um, why do very often, okay, let's, let's dial this back. Wine's an agricultural product. If you are planting something in your field and you know it's going to crop nine years and ten, you'll keep planting that. But if you've got a grape variety that gets downy mildew, or it drops its fruit when it gets windy, or it's susceptible to gray rot, or what have you, if it's just a bastard to grow, you're not going to grow it because it's really difficult to turn a profit. And some of the more interesting grape varieties out there, uh, I'm particularly thinking of Roussin and Carmenere, um, they really fell, uh, fell victim to this because they were just in the part of the world where they were being grown they were not financially viable. Uh, so very often you'll see that happen. Like Carmen Air, when Floxer wiped out all of the uh, Bordeaux grape varieties uh, between 1868 and 1880, um, there was, it was one of the six major varieties. So there's Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot, and Carmen Air were the six. Well, when they replanted Bordeaux after all the vines were wiped out, they just didn't replant Carmen Air because it got downy mildew, because Bordeaux is very wet, it's very foggy, it's fairly chilly, and that's exactly the type of uh, climate conditions that give you downy mildew. Where did Carmenere survive? Where did it take off? In Chile, where it's hot and dry and barely rains. So the downy mildew is literally not a problem. So Carmenere survived. Uh, with Roussin, um, it has survived because they basically went back and said, OK, well, what can we do with this? And they, they actually went back and they, they started doing, you know, not genetic manipulation in the sense of like um, GMO sort of things, but uh, they did it more in a tradition like Mendelian crossings and actually cr selectively breeding over time to create a more stable, reliable, less disease prone version uh, actually of Roussan. Um, if you look at a lot of the, uh, the grape varieties that were developed in the 20th century, they were all developed in Germany, uh, and all of those. Uh, were basically designed around the idea of creating a better, more cold-hardy, more disease-resistant, better version of Riesling. They all failed. Riesling is still the king. But they tried really hard from about 1905 to about 1935 to make a better version of uh, Riesling in Germany. Um, the other one is, yes, fads and fashion. Um, 
fads in fashion happen, you don't ever rip up vines. You don't pull them out of the ground. You cut them off basically about a foot out of the ground, and then you graft on new things. Um, a lot of those vineyards I was talking about in the south of France, where they have you know Chardonnay growing next to Cabernet growing next to Merlot, um, when Malbec blew up, uh, a lot of those vineyards in South France, they suddenly realized, oh, wow, our Chardonnay is not selling as well. Uh, let's plant Malbec. And it's not a matter of plant, because vines take a very long time to actually get established in the ground. So what they'll do is they'll cut it off uh, about a foot off the ground, and they'll graft on new vines. And within like two, three years, you're growing Malbec. You've got Malbec grapes that you can sell. So some of those commercial vineyards, they will just keep doing that. Uh, and the last category, um, this is uh, actually relates back to Canada. Um, if you remember we were talking with um, uh, Brett from uh, Avril Creek. We were talking about Marichal Foch and how that's a great variety where it takes almost 20, 30 years for that kind of foxy, nasty character to drop out of the fruit where it stops tasting weird. Um, you can't plant a crop now and say, okay, well, you know, in 15 years, watch out. No, no one's going to let you really, you know, no one's going to loan you money to do that, certainly. So, no, there, there is that too. Uh, we've got one more question, then we'll jump. Oh, good lord, I have 24 unread comments. Okay, let's let's finish with this. We'll get into the Duro, and then we'll get to the comments here, because otherwise I'm going to be on comments all night. Hello, Han. First red for you. You got her. And yeah, dear, dear, I, I think so too. There's a lot of raspberries in this. I, this definitely has seen oak, six months in oak, and a year in bottle. Um, but I have a feeling this is in the the Iberian sense of oak. Um, okay, I'm going to get on another tangent. But hey, we're all here for the tangents. We're not even at half past six. So let's just tangent it up. Um, the Iberians, the Spanish, and the Portuguese have a really, really unique understanding of how to use oak. When you go to California, you go to Australia, even you go to like France sometimes, you know, you, you look at the use of oak and it's like, well, if we want a lot of oak, we use American oak. And if we want a little bit of oak, we use French oak. But we always use oak that's kind of what's on first or second or third time. So you get this big kind of coconut and butterscotch and woody flavor from the barrel because the barrel is fairly young. Um, very often in uh, Portugal and Spain, the oak is important because it will allow the malolactic fermentation to occur naturally because the microorganism that does that lives in the oak. Um, but the other thing it'll do is, well, you know, an oak barrel, if it's well made, is absolutely watertight. It's not airtight. It's kind of like concrete in the sense that there's a lot of, tiny, a lot of little tiny pores in it that will very, very slowly add a little bit of microoxygenation into the wine. Microoxygenation or microoxidation, mumbled through that a bit. Um, and that will actually allow the wine to mature and soften and ripen a little bit in the barrel. I can pick up a whiff of oak on this, but it's really slight, and it's only because I know it's there that I really go looking for it. You could convince me this wine was unoaked on just a sip, I think. Uh, do vines stop producing fruit? Why do they get taken out? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, yes, the vines eventually stop producing fruit, and that's a matter of age. Uh, there are some vines uh, in Australia, like uh, this guy here. Um, this little wine from Best. Uh, this is still in the 1866 plantings of Pinot Munier that they planted, you know, 100 and some odd years ago. Uh, I'm not going to do that math in my head. Uh, but yeah, the, these are vines that are you know easily 150 years old, and they're still producing just fine. But they're producing almost nothing. They're producing maybe 5% of what those vines would have produced at, say, five years old. So if you're trying to make a wine that's you know going to retail on the shelf for $20, you can't really use century-old vines. It won't work. You can't get enough tonnage per hectare to actually make that work. Um, so when a vine is very, very young, um, it'll actually produce very little fruit. It'll produce a lot of green, uh, which is, say, stems, leaves, uh, all, all the what we call the green harvest. It's basically all the things that the plant produces that aren't grapes. So you're about five years old, the, the vine will produce lots and lots and lots and lots of fruit, but the fruit's not of the greatest quality because it's producing too much of it. You very often have a high cost with sending pickers or cutters out into the vineyard to just cut off extra bunches of grapes just to bring the harvest down because you want the vine to be focusing on a smaller number of grapes so that it actually puts you know, more effort and more uh, concentration into the smaller numbers of grapes that it has. Uh, younger vines, for whatever reason, also tend to produce relatively large water fat grapes, even if you don't actually irrigate them. As the vine ages, and this depends on the species, uh, I'll actually get to uh, a grape variety 
uh, called Pyfe from uh, South America here shortly. Um, basically, the, the longer that it ages, the less and less and less fruit it will produce to the point where eventually a vine will stop producing entirely. So very often a vine will get pulled out at 30, 35 years old because that vine isn't meant to make, you know, $60 wines. They're looking for something they can sell for $18.95. That vine is a very good vine. It could make exceptional wines, but it can't make it at a tonnage where they can actually do it commercially. So those vines will get uh, either cut off or pulled out. Uh, and in the, that case, it's actually pulled out because it's actually the root stock that's becoming less prolific. Um, neat case is actually Pythe from South America, specifically Chile. Uh, we have some wines made from this grape from the Itata region. Um, these are wines where uh, Pythe is really unique because it's really, really, really aggressively vigorous in its youth. Like for the first 50 years, it will give you so much green growth. It will give you so many grapes. It's just, it's way too aggressive about growing. And as a result, it doesn't make very good wine for the first 40, 50 years it's there. Uh, the, the vines that they're actually pulling the fruit from uh, from this region are almost 200 years old, and as a result of that, now those vines are actually acting like a you know 30 year old vine and starting to make some interesting wines off them. It just it starts out by going absolutely cuckoo bananas, and it takes a couple of centuries for it to calm the hell down. So that's a really unique example of it. But usually, um, it's just age. The the vine kind of tails off slowly over time, and depending on the species, obviously, or the varietal. It, it, it either will keep producing small amounts in perpetuity or it'll just stop. Pinot Noir is really famous for just stopping at about 100 years old. It doesn't matter how much you baby the vine, it won't give you any fruit. Uh, and the comments just keep coming. I love it so much. Okay, we are seriously going to get on to the next one. I'm sure that for those of you who love tangents, you're all in for this. But for those of you who don't, you're probably like, oh God, please, Kyle, just hurry up. We, we budgeted an hour for this. So let's go on to the most famous region of Portugal, the Douro Valley. Now, when I say the most famous region in Portugal, I mean it is the primary port producing region in Portugal. This is where the port lodges are. And when we talk about Portuguese wine, we have to start talking about port. Port is effectively wine where as it's fermenting, before it's finished fermenting, so it's actually dry, they give it a little ladle full of brandy, effectively. Uh, and that Produces the, increases the alcohol to the point where the yeast naturally stops fermenting uh, because yeast is rather naturally limiting in that sense and it will actually give you slightly sweet, very strong and very, very long-lived wines. Now, the reason for that was for basically the entirety of history, France and England have hated each other and been at war. Now, the British love wine. Uh, the UK was the very, very first uh, export market and the very first cosmopolitan wine market on earth. And when I say cosmopolitan wine market, I mean the idea of a liquor store wine shop in the modern sense where you could buy Italian wine and Spanish wine and French wine and Chilean wine. You could buy it all in one place. Um, still to this day, with, with some exceptions, but if you go to France, not only can you not find Spanish or Italian wine, you really can't find wine produced further than like 30 kilometers from the shop you're in. It's very localized and that's great. But the idea of having a wine shop where you could buy wine from all over the world, that was uniquely the UK at the very start. But the problem was is they were shipping wines, you know, in wartime from Portugal to the UK. And as a result of that, you know, they were shipping them in these big, you know, completely unrefrigerated wooden ships that leaked like sieves to the point where they had to be pumped out every day. You know, salt water would eventually get around the barrels and intermingle a little bit. And if you were shipping, you know, a light, delicate, you know, very pretty white wine like this, it wasn't going to make it. Even a big, strong red wine probably wasn't going to make it. So they gave it a little shot of brandy just to bring up the alcohol, to make the wine more stable, to allow it to actually survive. Um, and that actually is a taste that the British public, the buying public, uh, got. And they really love that flavor. Uh, to this day, I think like 61 or 62% of all port consumed is uh, consumed within the UK. It's still by far the biggest uh, region for it. Uh, now, the port blend, um, we're going to go back to the map here really quickly, Aaron. Uh, so the Duro Valley here starts with Oporto, and Oporto is where the port lodges themselves are. Now these are usually owned by Brits, so they have you know very atypically Portuguese names like Churchill and Graham and Taylor Fladgate uh, and Sandeman. Um, but yeah, they're, they're predominantly owned by British exporters. Uh, and then as we go up the Duro, uh, we get into Bayo uh, and Pinhaio, and then into the Duro Superior. 
Um, so this part of the Douro is very, very narrow and very, very terraced. Uh, the water is navigable. You can actually book uh, like riverboat tours because the, the Douro is a very big river. Um, but it's a very, very steep valley and it's very rocky. So all of these kind of lower parts of the Douro, it's very, very hot. You get the sea breezes coming off the Atlantic to cool it down. But this is basically a big kiln. And then very much like here, it can be plus 30, plus 35 in the summer, but it gets very, very, very cold in the winter. It's very bitter, again, with the breezes coming off the ocean. Uh, the upper Douro, past Pinhayo, this is what's called the Douro Superior. Um, there's a really, really ugly set of rapids uh, just past this village here. Um, that historically all of the port wines were brought down by op to Oporto by barge. So this part of the river, because where boats would have had to navigate those rapids, which were broadly unnavigable, they, uh, they couldn't source wines from up here. So they ended up being very, very underdeveloped for a very long time. The other thing about this upper part of the, the river, um, it's very, very flat. And whereas everything down here all has to be hand harvested because of these steep hand cut terraces, the upper part of the river being uh, a little flatter, you actually can use uh, mechanized harvesting. So the big uh, vibrating tractors that shake the vines to release the grapes. Um, if you actually follow the Douro up uh, into Spain, uh, we actually get another famous wine region, uh, the Ribera del Duero, which you know, literally means the, the banks of the Douro uh, in central Spain. Uh, which is, uh, along with Rioja, one of the best uh, Tempranillo uh, regions in the world. So let's talk about this. So when we're talking about the port blend, the big grape is Triga Nacional. It literally means our national grape. At its core, it is a big, powerful, inky black grape with tons of white pepper, tons of Easter lilies and violets, and then tons of black and blue fruit. It's a big punch of a wine. I don't really get the lilies on this, this wine, although it's not from the Douro, is the same blend. So we'll talk about these two wines kind of side by side. Um, these are the inky, wine, the inky, inky, powerful grapes. They're designed to live, you know, 150 years. You know, these are not unreliably long aging grapes. Like we sell Taylor Fladgate 40 just in a bottle on the regular shelf. It's a 40 year old wine made from Triga Nacional, Chiriga Franca, Tinto Roriz, uh, Trincadera, which is the one I always can't pronounce, uh, and I believe the last one is Alicante Bouchat. Uh, so these are your typical like port grapes that go into making that. And they also make, because it's the same valley, they also make the wines from this region, even if they're done as still wines. Uh, the Duro Valley does not make a lot in terms of white. It is too hot. Uh, it's not like Spain, where you get some of these, you know, super high acid grape varieties. Um, uh, in central Spain that actually can survive the heat. There's really not a lot of white production in the Douro. It's universally either made red table wine or port. Yes, there's white port, but white port's an abomination anyway. Right off the hop, even though this is a big wine at 14% alcohol, and this is actually at half a point less at 13.5, this feels bigger, it feels lusher, it feels softer. If you wanted to say this reminded you of like a Californian Cab or an Australian Shiraz, but from Europe, you're not too far off. And this is not an expensive bottle of wine. This is easily the least expensive wine that we've done, uh, not only in this lineup, but I think in all our wine tastings all time. Oh, hello, Hand, one of these. Glad you could join us. So this is, I do get a little of the Easter lilies that I kind of, not if I stick my nose all the way into it, but if I kind of come at it half at an angle, I get a little whiff of it. It's just hanging on right at the top. And I could also say that it almost reminds me a little of vanilla too. I, okay, this is the story I wanted to tell about this. Um, going back a very, 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 very long ways. Uh, the very first winemaker's dinner I ever got to host, because of course this was my father's store before mine. Um, I got to host a winemaker's dinner. It was going to be all my work, all my effort, and I wanted to do a Portuguese dinner. Uh, and we did it at uh, La Bella Note in the old fire hall. Uh, and I chose to do Portuguese wines. Um, and the wine that was like the, the big wine for dinner uh, was actually a Turiga Nacional that was that particular vintage, just you couldn't get away from the flowers. It actually didn't show well because the floral component was like perfumey. It was almost aggressive how lily and vanilla this wine was, and it actually didn't work, and I was super worried about it. Um, that, was, that was an embarrassing moment doing that, and it's like, oh good, the big showpiece wine we did for the dinner didn't show at all. Um, that, was, that was a heck of a night.
Just quickly running through the comments because I'm now 50 comments behind. So well done, me. Ooh, Corey, uh, that's a fun question. Hang out with another couple of questions. Come Who is Andrew Hilton? Well, that is actually uh, the middle names of our two founders. Um, my father, Max Andrew Baines. My name, middle name is also Andrew, actually. Uh, and then his uh, original business partner, Jim Hilton Langston, uh, who left the store uh, in the very early 90s to go off and be a judge. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, my dad was a court reporter, and he went into business with uh, a lawyer at the time who went on to be a judge. And uh, they opened the store just kind of as a fun side business in 1985. And it's been here 35 years at this point now. So yeah, that's that's where the name comes from. Um, my dad obviously still comes in the store. He's going to join us for the uh, Australian tasting. And uh, I do still see Jim around. He still has excellent taste in wine. And yeah, I, I also prefer when the oak is a little more subtle. Um, I get a little more of the oak on this one. Um, if you look for it almost as like a buttery, toasty coconut on this, I get a little more of the oak. This to me is a little more, to me this reminds me of the, the white label um, from Pago Casa Benesal during the Spanish week, the, the very first red we did that week. It's, it's bright and it's fresh and it's fruity and it's, it's very kind of table wine, peasant winey, and I, I really love it for its authenticity and I, I like it for that. This is very clearly well put together, and this is this is sixteen ninety five on the shelf all day long in the store. I've been recommending this as like I want to spend just about fifteen dollars on a bottle of wine. This just that. There's nothing I have from California or Australia that even is in the wheelhouse of this. This is just great value all day long. The nice part of this is we can do you know twenty five and thirty dollar wines like these that are you know we can fit them in the budget. And yes, um, Vivino, Facebook of wine. Um, I didn't mean that to sound that petty. I like Vivino. Um, Vivino is interesting because you get really weird results. Uh, like I think Apothic Red is still sitting at like four and a half stars because people really love it. Um, it's just like rate beer. It's a crowdsourced opinion gatherer. So there are people all over the wine spectrum. I find the more off the beaten path the wine you are choosing gets, like something like Okay, literally everything we're doing tonight uh, are all fairly off the beaten path wines. Um, you're going to get really, really honest reviews. I find wines that are fairly commercialized, wines that um, are in basically every liquor store um, and very often become people's kind of everyday sort of table wine. They can have artificially inflated scores. But if you're looking for something and you don't recognize it and don't know anything about it, you'll probably get a reasonably accurate score. I just I hate looking at you know some of these scores. It's like, wow, Wolf Boss, you label holding strong at 4.25 out of five. Good job, guys. Um, I don't know. That's that's my only beef with that app. It's actually a very very good app. Grant Adamson asks a question I genuinely can't answer. Do any vineyards use growth regulars to control the green biomass growth? Okay, I don't know. I'll tell you what I do know. Um, when you're working in the vineyard, over time the vine will actually become less prolific and will naturally produce less green biomass. And there's also what's known as the green harvest, which is you go out usually once in spring to, to clip off the, the flowers or the very, very early forming grapes. And then depending on what you need. Um, so uh, when we were talking to the Argentine chaps, they were talking about uh, pergola uh, vine training, where they leave all of the green growth on the top of the vine to shade the grapes. Sometimes, uh, especially if you're making something like, um, let, let's just use the Okanagan, where we have a very short growing season. If you're making like a higher alcohol red, you need all the sunlight you can get. They'll go out two, three, even four times, and they'll just hack back that green matter uh, to actually allow the grapes to get as much sunlight as possible. Um, is there something being done in a chemical sense or in a genetic sense to make the vines less vigorous? I don't know. That's, that's a question I genuinely can't answer. But I know that 
A, they become less vigorous with age, and B, uh, there is a lot of work in the vineyard that goes into actually training the vines back to either encourage green matter to, to provide shade or into just cutting it back to increase the amount of sunlight on the grapes to get those big ripe fruit flavors. I'm glad you all like the tangents, that's great. And three comments down, Devin actually gives a better answer than I did. So that's good. Devin always gives, let me just, just call out to Devin, who, uh, who manages all of our uh, comments. Devin, of course, is the other sommelier here at the store. Um, he's like me, but smarter and better looking. Um, I, I love the laugh I got from everyone else, which tells me it's absolutely true. Um, but yes. Uh, <laughs> Devin is the one who handles all of our text comments, so uh, he, uh, he's, he's an absolute uh, star for doing these for us. Thank you, Devin. Uh, it's sitting at 3.7 on Vivino. Yeah, that's... Um, that's about my point. It deserves to have no stars and no points, and it should just die. Uh, okay. Aaron is getting mad at me because I need to talk about the things that are coming up. Uh, next week, beer tasting, Wednesday. We are going into sours. Just slide some space here. Full credit, by the way, to Aaron, who keeps this whole project from going hopelessly off the rails by the power of his whiteboard and his good be being good at technology. Um, he actually keeps all of this running like incredibly seamlessly. Uh, the idea that we can get you know two winemakers from Argentina and have it work that well is a massive credit to Aaron. Uh, so Wednesday, we are doing sours. We are going to return to uh, the blind men, lemons, limes, and clementines sour. Uh, we have the cucumber hippie by eight wired, which is a cucumber sour. I know what you're saying. That sounds stupid. Why are you doing that? And you're right. But this beer was so delicious that it was actually the impetus for me wanting to do a Sours Week because I love this so much. Uh, Cabin has Staycation, uh, which is basically, Cabin, I really hope you're not watching. It's Cabin's version of Jamrock. It's, it's very similar. It's a Berlin and Weiss with lacto and dark fruit. I really, really love it. And then we are going to do a traditional uh, Brussels style goods from Oud Beer Soul. Uh, this beer on its own is uh, $12.95 on the shelf. So the tasting package is going to be $24 this week. I'll get it back to $20 for the next few weeks. I just, I couldn't do a sour beer tasting and not do a lambic. And this was literally the cheapest lambic that I could get that I wanted to represent the style. So one week we're doing a $24 week. It's going to be a hell of a week because these all kill. Uh, and then this is just a special baby. So this is going to be a really, really fun beer week. Now, the wine. Oh, the wine. So as some of you know, I, uh, my wife uh, went down with me to San Luis Obispo, and it was a working holiday for both of us. She went down uh, as a registered psychologist to do a uh, training exercise in San Luis Obispo, and I went down for wine. And I went down, and I spent you know, some time with the guys at Brock Sellers, and I spent some time with uh, the guys at Donkey and Goat and some of the other really, really cool natural winemakers that we spend time with. But I really wanted to get up to Santa Rosa, just go to my favorite brewery, the brewery that I have gone to probably six times, even though it's in California, Russian River Brewing Company. That was my whole thing. I wanted to get up there and do that. I was kind of blocked off the whole latter part of the day on that Saturday. It was what I was going to do. And then I got to Stern. And I met Ryan Sturm. And Ryan's a giant Riesling nerd like me. And we just got to talking. And we spent, I, I swear I was there six hours. We just walked around. We ate um, custard apples off of his landlord's trees. Uh, we, we kicked around the vineyard. We, we bummed around the winery, tasting all kinds of madness. Uh, and eventually, it was all I could do to just be like, no, I can't. I have to drive to San Francisco tonight. Um, his wines are exceptional. Now. Being one of the absolute premier winemakers in California, his wines are not cheap. And I had no idea how I was going to do a Ryan Sturm event featuring Ryan Sturm, by the way. He's going to be with us next week, which is going to be amazing. Um, I had no idea how to do these because these are $30 to $35 wines. Well, happily, he also has the Companion Wine Company. So he has wines in a can. He has one of the best Sauvignon Blancs I've ever tasted. It's certainly the best I've ever had from the New World, uh, along with the Malvasia. He has his Riesling, and then he has his 
98% Riesling, colored with 2% Zin Rosé, which I actually got to taste this vintage for the very first time in the winery with Ryan. Uh, Ryan, Ryan and I get along like a house on fire. Uh, if you're going to do any of our wine tastings, tell your friends. This is going to be a really, really amazing one for the books. Um, the only issue is I could only get 60 bottles of this. So we sell traditionally more like 70, 75 wine tastings a week. I've only got 60 of this one. so. I'm never going to be the hard sell on the wine tastings, but for this one, book early because this one is going to sell out and Ryan is an absolute gem. Okay, let's go to the HT Tiago Cabaco Reserva. Now, Tiago Cabaco is the name of the winery. HT Reserva is the name of their absolute top of the line. Uh, and I would love to tell you a whole lot more about this winery, uh, except their entire website is in Portuguese with absolutely no English option. Uh, and my Portuguese is about as good as my ancient Greek, which is to say it doesn't exist. My Spanish is not bad. My French is actually surprisingly conversational. My Italian is not speakable, but I can usually get the gist of what they're saying on the back of a wine label. Portuguese is just its own animal, and I have no idea what that website was saying, and I bloody tried. So, what do I know about this wine? Uh, it is from the Alentejano, so we are down in that central south part of Portugal, just like with the Carlos Reynolds. But the grape variety blend is more like a Duro blend in the sense that it is Turiga Nacional, Turiga Franca, and this time they use the term Tintororiz instead of Aragones. Same grape variety, two different names for the same thing, which is the same blend as the Tons de Duarum. And right off the hop, wow, this is a big wine. Remember when I was talking about these types of wines having that white pepper characteristic? There's the white pepper. That's like fried chicken white pepper. There's just lots of it. And right off the right off the nose, we get these really evolved, pretty delicate. We get the little bits of florals from the Trigonacinal, but then we get like rich fruit. We get big body. This just this is a lovely one to just sip, just sit and smell. This is a wine I don't need to taste. I mean, I'm gonna drink the hell out of it, but I don't need to. This is a wine that I could just sit and smell all night because it's just charming. I get the pepper, I get the fruit, I get the little hints of florals. This jumps into my nose. This is, this is fine wine from Portugal in a very, very real way. And most of the wines in the store, I can remember when we've had them. All of these wines, every single one, has been the result of me standing right here with an, you know, a, a nervous sales rep on the other side of the counter trying to sell me wine. And I think all of these come from different people. And every single one of them, I. You know, I got the chance to try it for the first time, completely cold to it, never heard of the winery before, got to try it, tasted it, and then brought it in. And I, I now realize all of these are from different people, which I think that's the first time that's happened with our wine tasting so far. We've, we've usually had a theme or one importer we favored, but these are all very, very different importers. So, uh, And all of them very, very small as far as I can remember. I think this is one of Olivier's. Uh, I think that uh, the importer we bought this from, that was literally their only winery. I want to say that's Christopher Stewart, uh, and then I can't even remember where I got that one. So, uh, Nobilis apparently, because the name is on the back of the label. But yeah, l little tiny wine import agencies that just, they come down, they show us like a handful of things, and they, they bring really brilliant stuff. Hello, Han. A little wine for you? Yeah. Get your nose in this. This is really brilliant. So I'm just reading the comments here. Uh, Deandra asked, this is a silly, maybe a silly question, but enlighten me. Uh, here in Southwest Alberta or Canada, we're used to seeing wines from around the world, but we're also seeing, used to seeing BC and Ontario wines. Um, the production for Canadian wine is small enough, especially at the higher quality levels, that really like 
um, if you were here for the Avril Creek tasting, um, he basically said, you know, we, we sell in BC, we basically make nothing selling into Alberta, and that's our entire export market. Um, they work with some restaurants globally, but that's the exception. Most Canadian wine doesn't see the outside of Canada, just we don't make enough of it. Um, if I'm going to draw a comparable in terms of tonnage, uh, I would actually draw Switzerland, where they make some incredible wines, but they just don't make very much of it. Um, that will change over time. Um, like Brent said uh, from Avril Creek, you know, he's looking to get his wines on the wine list of famous restaurants and into people's mouths at famous restaurants. He's leading that charge. But there's just not enough premium Canadian wine, and the market for it, apart from like Canadian ice wine as a novelty, hasn't really showed up because there really isn't there's never been that great moment. Um, for, for those who don't know, uh, let's let's go back to the early early 80s and uh, the Paris exhibition, where you know the French were showing all of their great you know Bordeaux cabs and their great Burgundian Chardonnays and their great Burgundian Pinot Noirs and their great Rhone Valley Syrahs, uh, and the Californians showed up with you know all their own stuff, uh, and they ended up winning uh, the Chardonnay class, and they had this great you know break into the market you know watershed moment where this is now the the moment where america is going to be recognized as a great wine growing region i'm very distracted because a cute dog just came in the store um but canada's never had that moment um they've never had that incredible moment where this is where canada has its coming up party this is where we can say here's our wine here have it taste it this is this is what we're doing i don't think it's happened yet um part of that's just we don't make enough of it part of it's just a lot of it is quite pedestrian, and the really great stuff does sell out bloody fast. Um, like you look at Locke and Worth, we try to carry everything they make, and we have two wines at a time. You know, right now, we have one uh, just because they don't make enough. The really great stuff is rare. Canada will have its day, um, but we're just we're eight to ten years early, I think, for that real brilliant coming out moment where everybody says, "Wow, we need to get all about Canadian wine." And more than that, like when Argentina. Uh, had its big blow up in 2014, 2015, uh, and the whole world went nuts for it. They had about 30 to 40 times at least the total vineyard space that Canada has. If the whole world decided they wanted Canadian wine, we could support that export market for like three and a half days. It, it's not going to take off because we're going to be sold out in 72 hours. It's, it, we just don't make enough wine here, at least not premium wine. I'm very encouraged to see how many people are signing up for the uh, the wine tasting coming up next week. Thank you all very, very much. I'm really excited for it, too. Ooh, we're on to the rankings. Okay, yeah. Um, ooh, rankings. Oh, how do I rank these? Okay. Um, these two are basically a tie for me. I'm going to lean to the white because... You folks can't see it, but I've got three really, really hot lights shining on me all the time, and I'm always warm. So the cold white wine, and then this, then the HT. And finally, the wine from like the famous fancy wine region that everybody knows from Portugal finishes last. Not that this is a bad wine, but yeah, these are just better wines. Uh, four, three, two, one. Yeah, and I really like to. I also really like to. And yes, we do need to hoard and drink and support our Canadian winemakers, especially the people who aren't, you know, ludicrously trying to plant Shiraz in the Okanagan Valley, which will never ripen other than like one year in 10. The people who are doing it right, like uh, the folks at Avril Creek and the folks uh, uh, out at uh, uh, Sunday in August and Lock and Worth and all the other guys that we really, really like working with, um, they're going to be the people that we need to be supporting. I completely agree. Just watching the uh, the reviews come in. A lot of people loving four. Okay, now don't get me wrong, four kicks ass, but okay, folks, go back to two. Two's pretty great too. I'm, I'm gonna that's the hill I'm gonna die on is wine two. I say as I savor and love and thoroughly enjoy four. You know, hypocrisy at its finest, but I'm still on team two.
Uh, yes, I did kind of rattle off those vineyards very quickly. For wineries in Canada that I respect, um, Avril Creek, of course, uh, with Brett Rowland, who joined us uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Lock and Worth, also an Okanagan winery. Uh, Pearl Morissette, which is the winery project that uh, Brett worked at um, before Avril Creek. Uh, we carry their stuff as well. Uh, Wild Goose, who I didn't mention the first time, but who I think still make the best Riesling made in BC at least. Uh, pardon me. Um, did I say Lockenworth? I think I said Lockenworth. Uh, and I think that's everyone that I'm off the top of my head, but I'm probably missing five other wineries that I really like, but those are the ones that just off the top of my head I really respect. Okay, that concludes the formal portion of the tasting. Uh, let's get into the completely random questions portion. Uh, I apologize there's no winemaker to bully this week because sometimes it's fun just, you know, making them run around their deck and take pictures of their dog. That's usually my favorite part of the evening. Uh, but, uh, yeah, hit me up with questions, whether it's about Portugal or about wine or about anything in general. Uh, Marcella, yeah, I, uh, I agree. Uh, cloves is absolutely present. And if I said that I knew where that was coming from, I'd be a liar. Um, I will say that uh, Trincadera has a bit of a reputation for having a really tea-like quality. And if I was just, you know, taking an educated stab in the dark, I would say that's the great variety doing that, but that's just a stab in the dark. Oh yeah, the Lightning Rock. Oh God, I yeah, the Lightning Rock Chardonnay. Oh my God, Lightning Rock. Um, I don't know how that's Canadian. Um, their Chardonnay is life changing. It's expensive. It's a forty dollar Canadian Chardonnay. Which, if you want to just you know completely disregard everything I've talked about tonight when I'm recommending a forty dollar Canadian Chardonnay, that's fair. But my God, what a Chardonnay! Just the the spice, and you, you'd think you were in Jura or the Macanay with a wild ferment, and it's just, oh, that Chardonnay. That, that darn cat of a Chardonnay. I really like it. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that everybody's really enjoying these because this is the most fun I've had in years is doing these because I get to in interview, like, incredible, interesting people like Brent Rowland, and I get to interview the folks uh, from... Uh, think of trapezio last week and I get to expound on a wine region that I've had a personal fascination for for like 15 years and now I actually get to talk about uh, and next week we've got like a person I know uh, as an acquaintance in Ryan Sturm um, you know we're gonna work him into a friend it's gonna it's gonna happen over time um, we're reasonably nerds you know it's a brotherhood uh, and yeah it's just one of those things where this is this is what I've wanted to do my whole life and it it took a bloody pandemic to actually happen uh, because the, the wine education is what actually gets me out of bed in the morning. Uh, it's oddly sometimes stocking the beer fridge because that's actually kind of fun, especially in summer when it's really hot outside and the beer fridge is cold. But most of the time it's wine education. I'm curious, uh, Karen, what your very expensive ounce of port was because, I mean, I have had the chance to try ports back to the 1868, uh, not on my own dime, uh, Bon Taylor Flagates. I got uh, invited to an event where they were tasting this crazy like 1868, like year after Canadian Confederation port. Uh, and I got a chance to try it. I got a little tiny like thimbleful of it. Uh, and I thought it tasted actually worse than the 40 year. Um, but yeah, like port lives so long. Uh, and you can try these crazy, crazy things. Like we have ports on our shelves back to like, the early 80s or late 70s, like on the shelf all the time. And that's just madness. Uh, Jeremy, that's a really interesting question. Um, do I like anything out of the Niagara region? Yes, I do. I like Pearl Morissette. Uh, I've always, always really respected what Henry of Pelham does. I know they're kind of a big brand, but uh, especially with their Spec Family Reserve series, they do some really great stuff. And I still think just their standard $25 Bac Noir is one of the best uh, Vitis Labrusca uh, varietals out there. Um, I'm going to back that up just for a sec. So there's Vitis Vinifera, which is 
all of the European varieties, uh, and there's Vitis Labrusca, which is kind of European varieties crossed with the, uh, the varieties they found growing in North America. Most of them are not very good. Uh, Marichal Foch and Bacon Noir, uh, which are kind of Canadian specialties to a certain point, are kind of the two grape varieties that show very, very well. Uh, Henry of Pelham does a really, really good uh, Bacon Noir. Uh, I can feel my watch buzzing about every 30 seconds here, so if you're sending your questions as direct questions to the store, uh, I will get to them. I'll just get to them after the, the live broadcast, but I can't really check my watch for those right now. Uh, if you want to fill those same questions in the chat, I'll get to them immediately. Uh, how are wines or grapes selected to become port? Uh, to a certain point, it depends where they're grown. Uh, with port, you're looking for longevity ahead of everything else. And port's really, really interesting. Um, with port, it's kind of broken into one of three categories, and it's year by year by year. Uh, let's say, let's just, for really easy uh, explanation, let's say a year is, uh, a decade is nine years. Three of those years are the best years. Those are the years that are perfect climate conditions, perfect everything, the wine is spectacular, that becomes vintage port. It receives the smallest shot of brandy, it's put immediately into bottle, and it's something sold very young to the consumer for very high prices, usually $100 or more, for you to put under your basement stairs and give as a wedding present to your grandchildren. That, and that's talking in your, tw you buy it in your 20s for your grandchildren when they're in their 20s, like it lives forever. The mid-grade stuff is what we call uh, late bottled vintage. That's usually the years that are produced for like Taylor's late bottled vintage, Ware's Warrior, uh, Graham Six Grapes, all kind of those 20 to $25 like everyday drinking ports. They're not the greatest years, they're not the worst years. They add a little bit of brandy to them, but a little more than they do with the vintage ports. And it becomes a wine that's aged about five years in barrel and released to be drunk fairly young. That's just nice everyday drinking port. The weakest years are improved to being the highest forms of art by long-term barrel aging. And those are your 10, 20, 30, 40 year tawny ports. Uh, they are the weakest years, they may, maybe get rained out, or they have a fire, they have a blight. Those wines don't taste good young. So they throw them into a barrel, they give them a really healthy shot of brandy, and they let them sit for decades. And time and oak interaction and oxidation and a little bit of sea air coming up from the Atlantic up the Duro Valley, that changes it into something magical. So that's kind of how they delineate the different qualities of port. Some of the most expensive ports in the world, the 40-year ports, actually come from the weakest vintages. Uh, and the most expensive ports come from the very best vintages. It's actually the, the kind of average, you know, Tuesday pizza sort of vintages of wine uh, that actually end up being sold for the least money, which is very interesting and unique to port. Usually uh, with the wine region, the, the worst years aren't done anything with. Aaron, you're kind of giving me the eye. What do we know? Okay. Thought we might have run hopelessly long. Aaron usually gives me the stink out eye after we go about 75 minutes in. Uh, dear, dear, you're not sure you get the tea tasting note. Well, think slightly over tea. Okay. Maybe it's the difference in glasses between us because the glass will make a huge difference. Um, but my wife drinks a ton of tea, uh, and I wash a lot of her teacups. Uh, I don't drink very much tea, but this to me reminds me a little bit in the nose of slightly oversteeped like Earl Grey tea with that, that really upfront tannic note, and then those really pretty orange pico and tea notes right down the bottom. I definitely pick those up. Uh, can you cover the taste development like the last one? It evolves from dark fruit to tea. It takes a minute. Is it oxidation? Yes. At once the wine is in your glass, everything is oxidation. So the wine goes into the bottle young, really screamingly young in most cases. And it's a blend of alcohol, water, you know, uh, sugar, acid, and stuff, which is kind of all your flavoring compounds. Um, it takes a while for that to become homogeneous uh, and to actually become like a, a, a sum that's greater than its parts. Uh, and when we talk about travel shock, like a wine that's just freshly off the, uh, the shipping from the Atlantic, and it, it's just a big jumbled mess and doesn't taste like very much. It tastes like Beaujolais Nouveau. It's just primary fruit and bubble gum and nothing else. Uh, we call that travel shock because the, the, uh, the emulsion has basically become too disturbed and it takes 
between two and six months to actually sort itself out and start tasting like something again. And we've had some really fun stories of wines that we, we got and we were really excited about and we put it out and everyone hated it because it was travel shocked. And then we brought the same wine out six months later and we sold out in an afternoon. That happens all the time because the wine's just shocked. Um, it, wine is a fascinatingly co complicated emulsion of various different things in it. And then each bottle, once the cork's in it, you know, they all have slightly different levels of fill sometimes, depending on how old fashioned their filling bottle equipment is. They have different levels of acidity, just, you know, different concentrations in the larger filling vat. They didn't look at uh, versions of oxidation, like the, the wines that are filled from the very, very bottom of the, so the, when the filling vat's completely full and you bottle a thing off it, there's no oxygen. It, it doesn't really have that. But when you're bottling those last few bottles, you know, the, 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 the vat's making this horrible, like, rattling, like you're, you're sucking on a slurpy sound as it's, it's pulling air in and it's actually artificially oxidizing the wine. Those wines versus the wines at the very start of the fill are wildly different because they got all this extra oxygen at bottling. Every bottle, once it's corked, it's its own universe. It's it's got a lot of things in common with the bottle before it and the bottle after it, but if it was bought, if it was corked with an infected cork, that bottle's ruined. There's nothing that you can do with it. It doesn't matter if it's five dollars or five thousand dollars. Doesn't matter if it's a year old or a hundred years old. Doesn't matter what you paid for it. If it was bottled and corked with an infected cork, it's done. It's done the second it leaves the winery. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many different changes that can happen in terms of storage. Uh, I talked about this a little bit with uh, one of the previous tastings, I think during the Spanish, but even the cases that are on the outside of the shipping container, leaning against the warm outside steel of the shipping container, they're going to have a different journey compared to the more temperature uh, protected cases on the inside. Every wine has its own story right from the moment it's bottled, and even beyond the point it was bottled, right from the, the, the very moment where you know the, the vine flowers. It has its own story of those grapes that went into that bottle, and it was bottled that way and aged in that particular barrel, which had those flaws, and then it was aged either on the outside of the shipping container or the inside of the shipping container. And then even beyond that, you know, was it kept in a store that was kept cool and dark, or was it in a store that had, you know, bright fluorescent lights? It, it's, it's, it's wildly different. The, the whole process of every wine being super different I find so interesting and that's when I say you know I've had this wine once so I don't know anything about it that's what I'm talking about you know I, I need to try wine three or four or five times because there's bad wines that it can be an exceptional bottle of and I love the wine and then I get back on the second bottle it's like oh god what was that that's trash um, no wines are so different just depending on how they're treated because it's such a living living liquid and a living beverage that it's, it's infinitely changeable Man, we went on a hell of a tangent with that. Hello, Han. You've been waiting probably for hours for wine. That one? All right. Uh, and Michael, yes, you'd be correct. Uh, red Vina Verde would be very much like a Beaujolais. Uh, and I think even more like a Beaujolais Nouveau in the sense it'd be lightly sparkling and uh, bottled slightly underripe. So yes, it, it, I ex expect a Vina Verde Red, which I haven't had, would be very much like a Beaujolais Nouveau. Ooh, great question from Michelle. Um, how do you know which wines can keep for a few days after opening? Um, in a white wine, it's about acidity or oak flavor. Um, the higher the amount of malic acid, the longer the wine will live. But white wines, you know, if I opened this and had a glass and just left it on my desk overnight, I'd have questions about it because it doesn't have enough protective agents. When we talk about t protective agents, you know, oak aging, high alcohol, high tannin, these are all kind of the, the things that jump in front of oxygen to protect the wine. A wine that has, you know, reasonably low alcohol, you know, this has quite high acid, but uh, no tannin, uh, very low sugar. These are wines that are very, very susceptible to falling apart easily, whereas something like this, ha which has a ton of color, it has a ton of acid, it has a ton of tannin, it's clearly been oak-aged. It's been kind of bomb-proofed in the sense to, to live a long time in bottle, which is going to allow it to live a long time uh, once it's open. So in very, very short, high acid. If a wine is acidic as hell, it will live longer than one that isn't. Uh, young wine, a younger wine will live longer than an older wine once opened. University, there are really no exceptions to that. 
with reds in particular, the darker the red. Uh, so how a red wine gets darker is it's aged in contact with its grape skins, and it withdraws pigment from those skins, and it also withdraws tannin at the same time. That tannin is a natural, uh, not only antioxidant, but also uh, uh, just a natural preservative, and it will keep the wine going longer. A very pale red will last less long. Uh, and then finally, uh, wines of an oak age tend to be more stable because they've already undergone some oxidation just by living in oak. And then some of the compounds that an oak barrel puts into the wine uh, does contribute a slight pre uh, preservative effect. And I think we are getting to the tail end of the tasting. Not saying we're turning off the cameras just this second. I have some questions to get through. But uh, if you are, you know, sitting on the edge of your chair thinking whether you want to ask a question, now would be a good time because we are going to wrap this up very shortly. Also, Steve, thank you for diving in here and answering so many questions uh, before I can even get to them. I mean, you're killing us for content, but I really appreciate you doing it. Suggestion glass for a night where we taste the same wine or two across four different glasses. Wow, I would have to have way more glass inventory. Um, fun thing, we s like I sell these Gabriel glasses because it's glass I really like. Um, we sell them for $35 because this is effectively a, I'm not going to use the word knockoff. It's a knockoff of a $90 Austrian glass um, that Devin actually found when he was in Austria. We really love these because they're beautiful, wonderful glasses. Uh, if somewhat fragile because they're actually all one piece, like there's no machine mark on the neck. Um, I don't know how I would do a wine glass uh, section. I know that it makes a huge difference, but setting that up would be, compared to doing a wine tasting, ludicrously complicated because I have no idea. Like we sell so little glassware, so, so little. Uh, most of the glassware we sell is like, People who buy a bottle of champagne for like a newlywed and they want to throw in a couple of flutes. Like that's, that's about it. Like we don't sell much for glass. Um, I'd be nervous about that. I'm not saying it wouldn't work. It might be a huge success, but it makes me nervous just because I know how, or how little glassware we sell. I need to try wines four or five times as my COVID theme song. Mine too. And it's kind of just a nice watch word in general. Uh, any other Portuguese wines that I would recommend? Thank you, Jessica. That's actually something I wanted to get to. Uh, I left two really, really, really important wine regions off the list for tonight, uh, and those are Barrada and Dao. Um, Barrada is fun because you get to roll your R's. Um, they're kind of central Portuguese. They're just a little bit south of the Douro Valley. Uh, they work a lot with uh, the local grape varieties like Alforqueiro and uh, Alicante Bouchette. They're interesting. They're tricky to sell down here. I've brought in some wines from uh, Dow in particular that were just not saleable. Um, but I really recommend them because they're very much like the Carlos Reynolds in the sense they're, they're kind of these field blend, peasant wine, local. Y you, you feel the local region sorts of wines. Um, th they're tricky to sell, but if you see a Bayrada or a Dao, uh, they're absolutely worth picking up. The Dao is D-A-O. Uh, and Bayrada is uh, B-A-I-R-R-A-D-A. -A. Uh, both really great regions from Portugal that I just, I couldn't fit into a four wine tasting, but I didn't want to talk about. Uh, cocktails done, yes. Uh, Aaron, how are we doing on Cantankerous Cocktails episode one? Next couple of weeks, you know. Like Next couple of weeks, yeah, gonna come yeah, out? Yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, so yes, we do have Cantankerous Cocktails. For those of, us, of you who joined us for did that random panel show up Wednesday? Or was that wine tasting last week? I was wine tasting last week. So yes, we are doing a cocktail series. Um, and we shot it uh, Friday last week. Uh, and for those of you who are here for the tasting, you got a sneak preview and a very unintentional video error uh, where we kind of posted a scene of it for like a good couple of minutes. That's going on the blooper reel. Uh, but yeah, uh, we are doing a cocktails thing. Um, it's in development. We're still working out the bugs. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have something. Uh, it's not going to be live, but it, it is going to be shot. And it's going to be a lot of fun. 
it's uh, it's a little less serious than the wine tastings. It's designed to be silly and fun and just interesting. Um, it, it, we have a guest speaker in Mike, uh, who is uh, one of our longest serving staff, and he's uh, as much as you know. Nigel's the beer guy, and Devin's the wine guy, and I'm the wine and scotch guy. Uh, Mike is very much the cocktail and spirits guy, so he's uh, absolutely the right person to do it for us. So I think he'll be really happy with how they're coming along. And if you're not, we'll discontinue them because they're expensive to produce. <laughs> And I think at, at that point, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, I think we're done here. Uh, we will see you folks uh, for Wednesday for Sour Ales. Uh, and next week on Friday for uh, the Ryan Sturm California White and Rosé tasting. Uh, like I said, we're going to cap that at 60 just because that's how much wine we've got. Or I guess I need a wine to taste, so 59. It's going down all the time. Uh, in the meantime, I've been Kyle with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits. Thank you to Aaron for doing everything that he does because he's amazing. And thank you for all of you for joining us. This has been just a wonderful ride. Uh, thank you all very, very much, and goodbye. Same summer sun, but here, oh, they lie.